Hello and welcome to another exact value video. I want to continue this series with an important and pretty nifty video. Instead of finding the exact value for the sine at just one angle, we're going to be ambitious and find three. And as an added bonus, at the end of the video, we'll multiply these three values together and hopefully see something interesting. Well, specifically, you'll see our first goal is to determine the exact value for each, the sine of 10 degrees, the sine of 50 degrees, and the sine of 70 degrees. Well, so far in the series, all the angles we have determined have been multiples of 3, like the sine of 6 degrees or the tangent of 18 degrees. This is great and all, but a bit limited. Once we have the exact values for the sine of 10, 50, and 70 degrees, we'll be able to use these values and other trigonometric identities to determine the exact value for the sine of any integer degree we like. But of course, with great power comes great responsibility. Well, let's take a look at the decimal equivalencies for these three values. Hmm, they don't seem very accommodating, but I bet with a little math we can find the exact values for these numbers. Let's start by setting x equal to 10 degrees. And by multiplying each side of the equation by 3, we have 3x equals 30 degrees. And we'll follow that up with taking the sine of both sides of our equation and replacing the sine of 30 degrees with its numeric value, 1 half. And of course, our friendly sine of 3x has a rather amicable counterpart, a triple angle identity that we can substitute in. And I think at this point, we'll say goodbye to the sine terms altogether by making one final substitution, u equals the sine of x. So instead of having a trigonometric equation, let's work exclusively with a polynomial equation. And remember, if u equals the sine of x and x equals 10 degrees, then when we solve for u, we'll really be solving for the sine of 10 degrees. Well, that seems pretty appealing. And so here we are with our very unassuming polynomial equation. It's a nice cubic polynomial, and you'll notice there is in fact no quadratic term. Well, this doesn't seem too bad at all, right? Well, let's start by setting this equation equal to zero to see if there is, you know, something nice we can do for it. Maybe dinner and a long walk on the beach? No, I was thinking more like to see if we can factor the expression and see just what it's made of. So here's the equation that we would like to solve, and that guy sure seems happy about it. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like the polynomial expression on the right side of the equation is going to factor easily. But maybe we could use the rational root theorem. Remember, that's the thing with the p and the q. Well, it seems like the possible rational roots are going to be u equals plus or minus 1, plus or minus a half, plus or minus a fourth, and plus or minus an eighth. Unfortunately for us, none of these values actually work. Our narrative seems to have taken a dark turn indeed. Well, let's step back a bit. We'll change this equation into a function, and let's take a look at its graph. We can see there are three real zeros on this graph, and in fact, all of them are between negative 1 and 1. And remember, the range for the sine function is from negative 1 to 1, so this is a good sign, you know, since we're looking for values of sine. One important note, and one that our yellow friend finds quite intriguing, since the rational root theorem failed to supply us with any rational roots, yet we see there are indeed three real roots for this function, then all the roots must be irrational. No, not the let's make bad choices, you know, kind of irrational. Just the let's be radical kind of irrational. Let's take a quick peek at the decimal approximations for these real zeros. Well, they seem like they could be values for the sine of 10, the sine of 50, and the sine of 70 degrees, at least the first few digits. But can we really be sure? Let's revisit our initial equation, the sine of 3x equals 1 half. Well, when x was 10 degrees, we saw that the sine of 30 degrees was indeed 1 half. Well, what about 50 degrees? A quick substitution shows that this works as well. Interesting. Well, what about this other rascal, this 70 degrees? Plugging this in gives us the sine of 210 degrees, which is actually negative 1 half. I bet this negative sign makes a difference. Look at how it affected the graph in a negative kind of way. Okay, 
let's take a moment and collect our thoughts. We created a beautiful equation with three real roots, none of which were rational, so beautiful but complicated. Okay, so let's try another strategy. Let's write our polynomial equation in a different form. We'll write it with the variable terms on the left and the constant on the right. And we'll take a short journey back about 500 years and look up an old mathematician friend. And let's see if I can pronounce his name right. Gerolamo Cardano. Well, what we have is a cubic polynomial equation, so let's try using the cubic formula on it. The same cubic formula that Cardano published in his treatise Ars Magna. We even have our equation written in the correct form. And as we pointed out earlier, there is no quadratic term. Well, this seems almost too good to be true. Well, maybe that's because we haven't actually looked at the formula yet. Anyway, if you'd like to read more about this formula, here is a link, along with a yellow fellow who seems rather eager to learn more. Teachers do enjoy having students like that. No, not the yellow part, the eager part. Anyway, I've also copied the link down in the description for the video, so it's easy to copy and paste. Well, let's dig into the formula and see what we can see. We have some variables for which we need some values. Capital Q and capital R will be values that we can find from using numbers in our polynomial equation. And let's tuck those away for a moment. Then we also have S and T, which will be cube root expressions that will employ our Q and R, which are lying in wait you know, over there on the right side. Notice, if you will, that the only difference between S and T is the sign in the middle of the cube root expression. And here's the money shot, the three roots for this equation, in all their glory. Well, we'll take one root at a time. So here we go, Cardano's cubic formula. We can see from our equation that the value of P is negative 3 fourths, and the value of Q is negative 1 eighth. These don't seem so bad. We'll be using these two values in our capital Q and capital R variables. So capital Q is going to be one third times negative three fourths, which will be negative one fourth, and we'll tuck that away for a moment. Capital R is going to be one half times negative one eighth, which is negative one sixteenth, and let's tuck that away as well. So now onto the S and T portion of our problem. Plugging our values in seems to give us quite the fractional expression, but we can simplify, 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 and see that s equals one half of a not too terrifying cube root of a complex number. Huh, strange. I thought we decided the roots were going to be irrational, not complex. Well, not so fast. Since s and t are the cube roots of complex conjugates, those cube roots will end up being complex conjugates themselves. And when we add them, the imaginary parts should cancel and leave us with a real number. Let's look at this graphically so we can get a better idea of what's about to happen. So here we have both S and T graphed in the complex plane. You can see the horizontal axis is the real number line, and the vertical axis is the imaginary number line. And we can add some reference lines for each of these complex numbers. And then we'll use head to tail addition and see that the terminal point is indeed on the real number line, which indicates that the sum of these two cube roots will indeed produce a real number and not a complex number. So the imaginary parts cancel and we see that this problem might not be so complex after all. So let's put it all together now and look at our first root, u sub one. It seems like all we have to do here is add s and t together and call it good. It appears there is no simplification we can do, so let's go ahead and check out the decimal equivalent for this number. Well, it appears to be the sine of 50 degrees. Cool. Let's get a second opinion. We'll wolfram this bad boy and see what he has to say. Yeah, that's what we like to see. So here is our first value, the sine of 50 degrees in all its splendor. Check. On to value two. Well, u sub two has a bit more of a complicated look and feel than his older brother, u sub one. Some would say maybe even a bit more sophisticated. Nevertheless, let's go ahead and substitute our s and t values into the expression and see what we have. Well, apparently nothing that looks nice, but will it simplify? Well, somewhat. Well, how about the decimal approximation? Oof. It's negative. 
Well, I guess that shouldn't be too much of a surprise. When we were working with the graph of our function earlier, we saw that this root would be negative. And it's because that when we plug 70 degrees into our sine of 3x formula, we got the sine of 210 degrees. Well, 210 degrees is in the third quadrant, and we know sine is negative in the third quadrant. But in our case, we want the sine of 70 degrees. And since 70 degrees is in the first quadrant where sine is positive, then we'll just do some, you know, minor reconstructive surgery here to get rid of this little negative problem. And voila. And Wolfram says, what? Yeah, it seems we're in good shape. So check and check. Last value. Well, hopefully it's the sine of 10 degrees since we have the other two already. Well, u sub 2 and u sub 3 are kind of identical twins. They look almost exactly the same, but they have a little different personality. You'll notice the sign change in the middle. Well, this won't affect our little bundles of joy too much. Let's go ahead and substitute in our s and t values one last time. Maybe simplify it a little and try to get a decimal approximation. Okay, it seems like it could be the sign of 10 degrees. Wolfram? Yeah, good to go. So check, check, and checkmate. First goal accomplished. So here are all of our values. Don't they look simply radiant? Let's go ahead and move on to our second and final goal. We're going to multiply these three values together and see what we get for the product. Well, we could just put these three numeric values side by side and start multiplying, but let's be a bit more calculated about our approach. Instead, let's take the expressions for our three roots and multiply those. We will have to keep in mind, however, that since one of the roots ended up as a negative value, when we multiply these three, the product will also end up being negative, so we'll just need to strip that negative sign away when we're done, since we're actually multiplying three positive numbers, which will result in a positive number itself. Well, side by side, they don't look too bad. Well, especially the last two, since they appear to be the factorization for the difference of two perfect squares, which means finding their product will be a cinch. The next multiplication will give us this little expression, which, if memory serves me right, looks exactly like a factoring formula we learned about in algebra. Look at that, the sum of cubes. Mind blown. So, if all we have to do is cube S and cube T and then add them up, what are we waiting for? Especially since S and T both contain cube roots. All right, simplify, simplify, simplify. The imaginary parts cancel, and we're left with negative one-eighth. Wait, one-eighth? That seems almost impossibly exquisite. So let's go ahead and strip away that little nasty negative sign because of our you know, previous discussions, and bingo, one-eighth. And now we've completed both of our goals. I feel like there should be fireworks or something, maybe a parade? Yeah, I would actually just settle for some cake. Nevertheless, this is pretty satisfying. So if you liked what we had going on in this video, be sure to share it with your friends, or share it with your neighbors, or share it with your friendly neighbors, and subscribe to my channel for more upcoming math videos.